Yeah, that was an especially beautiful prayer. Thank you so much. Um, we are blessed to have um, Mary Stevens speaking to us today, and Roger and Gail's daughter, Perry, is going to introduce Mary. Okay, I don't want to take a lot of time away from this amazing speaker you have. You guys have a lot going on pre pre meeting, um, but I just want to say thank you so much for all your prayers my entire life because you guys have been there for me and your prayers are answered. We are doing great, so I appreciate everything that you guys always pray for when in my life. Um, Mary Stevens, I met her in when she was in sixth grade. Okay, she's twenty four now. I was her D group leader over at the Dodd the disciple groups, small groups that they had for the kids and just fell in love with this girl, love her to death. I feel like she's my soul sister. She grew up in this church. Her parents are Eric and Cammy Stevens, very involved. She was um, in youth group her whole life. She also helped with vacation Bible school. She's been in a lot of the music programs. She's been in the plays before. Um, it's just been so exciting to watch her, to be able to be an um, honor to be her coach and mentor as she grew up in the church through the, those seven or eight years that I got to be her small group leader was just a blessing to me. She's amazing. She's a Georgia Tech graduate, a degree in biology. And she is now on this amazing missions trip in Chile. She's bilingual and she's going to be in Chile with these little back and forth home visits until 2025. Mm. So she is dedicating so much of her young life and this beautiful young woman, I am proud to present her to you today. So make sure you ask her some great questions later. I asked her her highest high and lowest low, but she's just amazing. So please welcome Mary Stevens. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm super excited to be here. Um, thank you so much. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so this morning, I am hoping to talk, or I'm planning to talk, about Jesus through community. And as Ms. Perry just described, I've grown up in churches in different communities, and so I'm excited to share with y'all a little bit about my experiences and how those have led me to Chile, and then what exactly it is we do in Chile, and how God has been faithful. So these are some photos, um, but I'm going to go ahead to say this. I want to start out and say that my life has been changed by Jesus. That's why I'm here. And specifically has been changed through experiences within Jesus-centered communities. So as I said, um, oh, the clicker does not work anymore. It doesn't work. I can do it then. Okay. Let me try this one. Okay. Well, I'll keep talking. Um, <laughs> and so the, the next slide is going to show exactly what I've said in terms of how this, this flow is, is going to work this morning. I know it helps me to know what I'm about to hear, to be able to hear it well. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to start with a little bit about who I am, as Ms. Perry just presented, um, a very brief amount of the ministry, perfect. And I'll go ahead and do that. So this is a photo of me um, on the sand dunes in Viña del Mar, Chile. Um, so there's, I live on the coast right now, and there's one section that's just these giant dunes. And when I want to remember how how big God is or how small I am in the world. I like to get on a bus and show up to those dunes and climb up and see sunset. But anyway, that's not the point of the slide. The point of the slide is who I am. So I was born and raised in Roswell, um, grew up in RUMC here. I graduated from Centennial High School. Yes, graduated from Georgia Tech shortly after with a degree in biology. Um, some of my hobbies include um, creating music, whether that's through shows or through acapella groups or choirs. And then I really like exploring and discovering new things, which you can see in the way that I cook or experiment. Um, also the way that I travel and I enjoy hiking. Um, and so, as I said, I live right now in Viña del Mar, Chile, um, and there will be a map later if you don't know exactly where that city is. Okay, cool. So the ministry, I like flow charts. They make things easier to understand, but we're going to start at the bottom and work up because you know me, I'm here. 
I work on a team with four other people featured in the photo. So it's me, Greg, Ellie, Vicky, and Koke. Um, Greg is also from the United States and is married to Ellie. They have their beautiful daughter, Lydia, there. And Vicky and Koke are Chileans who have also joined the team as a part um, or as, as a part of their experiences in a community very similar in Santiago. So we make up, oh, I would like to stay on that one. Sorry about that. That's okay. Oh, other way, other way, other way, other way. Oh, Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of photos to come. Okay. There it is. So just above now our team, we're the team for Eloasis Vina. And Eloasis Vina is one of 14 total ministries around the world that all fall under the category of global scope. And Global Scope is one of eight ministry areas within Christian Missionary Fellowship International. Um, fun fact, one of the other international college ministries is in Chile, and that's the Santiago Ministry. And Santiago is about an hour and a half drive from Viña. Have a little bit of perspective. Okay, ready. So now I'd like to get into how I got here and a little bit more of how we do what we do. So um, my, the first 18 years of my life, I spent mostly around RUMC, and there were a lot of different missional um, and ministry opportunities that really cultivated me and fostered my desire to know God, to know Jesus, and to pursue my faith further. So I would say overarching life lesson and relating specifically to experiencing Jesus through community during that time was that it takes a village to inspire a personal relationship with Jesus. Now the photo, um, this is Miss Penny Connor, <coughs> who was one of my first music teachers. Um, and I'm there next to my lifelong best friend, Caitlin Gino. Um, and this, this photo was on our fridge, I think for like 10 years. I don't even know, I think it was in a newspaper, maybe, uh, could be my memory, but needless to say, it's a cherished photo for me because it's it was the spark, I think, in a lot of ways towards why church became a home and I became so eager to continue building communities like this. So children's music was important. Next. Also, youth small groups. As Ms. Perry just mentioned, um, she was one of my really important D group leaders, um, one of many. Again, it takes a village, so there were many other adults and older students who invested in me during my time over at the Dodd. Um, but this photo in particular was taken after our D group leaders, our senior year, received the best D group leaders of the year oh. award. So a quick applause. <laughs> And this is the another photo where I had taken the leader position. So one of the things I find incredibly valuable about the youth program here is that many older students have opportunities to lead the younger students. And for me, that was incredible. Um, I grew so much in knowing that my stories, my experiences could in some way be beneficial to the younger students. So this is a photo of me. Again, Caitlin's on the other end. Clearly, we traveled around um, through church activities together. Um, but the four girls in the middle were part of our um, confirmation group. Um, and so we served as ex-cons for these girls and a few other guys as well. And this was actually taken about six months after confirmation when we decided to have a quick reunion and we camped out in my backyard the night before and then all came to church. So we looked surprisingly good for a night of sleeping in a tent. I think actually Caitlin and I stayed in the tent but the girls ended up inside. <laughs> um, yeah, and so in addition to the, the children's music here on church campus, the small groups also on church campus, the mission trips that I was a part of during high school really opened my mind. Um, this photo is from the Kenya mission trip. And actually, Abigail Bridges is in there somewhere. There she is. She's hiding. Oh, no, that's not her. Uh, well, somewhere. somewhere. <laughs> She's there. Well, she should be there. <laughs> there she is. But anyway, so it's cool to hear that um, she is also going into missions now. And um, Elizabeth McDonald's also part of that photo. She's now a missionary. 
So I have no doubt in saying that mission trips, international mission trips in particular during high school change lives. Um, so if you ever have an opportunity to support those, I recommend. <laughs> Um, one other thing I want to say about that photo in Kenya um, is that I had a very like pivotal moment while I was there. And I remember sitting in a, it was like our community day. And I was sitting across from a woman. We were painting each other's nails. And I remember we didn't speak much of the same language. Um, but I don't remember that being a problem. Um, somehow we found ourselves laughing, inviting each other to dance. Um, and sharing stories through lots of hand motions. Um, but I gave that woman my email address. And like a few weeks later, she sent me an email. Um, it kind of was like rough English, like, hi, how's, how's it going? Thank you. It was nice meeting you. And so it was cool. I sent her an email back and didn't hear anything of it. Um, but three weeks ago, she sent me an email. And it's been seven years or six, six. Wow. So, um, that that's incredible to me. Um, but what I really wanted to say about that is also in that moment and being able to share so deeply, I felt like with this woman, in spite of all of these cultural differences, language differences, background differences, religious differences, I experienced God's love. And in that moment, I was like, God's love is so big. It's so much bigger than any limitations. Even traveling across the world isn't enough to separate us. Um, which I know there's Bible verses about that, but still experiencing it firsthand is a whole different um, thing. And I just shared that the other day with somebody who asked, why do you think you're doing missions? Like what happened? I was like, well, I had this moment in Kenya. So I do think it really had a big impact. So when I graduated high school, I went to Georgia Tech and realized that I also wanted a community, a faith community, um, people who would encourage me in my walk with Jesus. What I found was something even greater. Um, I became a part of Georgia Tech Christian Campus Fellowship after trying many other campus ministries. And one of the reasons that I really took, took root there um, were the way that they asked questions. I felt like people wanted to know me and not just know what I studied and what town I was from, but like what made my heart tick. And through that, I saw them ask questions to people who were very different from them. And I soon became part of the culture of asking questions and learned when Jesus is available through community, you start to see this questions that generate acceptance instead of questions that generate judgment. And with these particular ladies, um, I, I was in a small group, and this was during one of our events where we dressed up and went to the roller skating rink. Um, so I don't, I didn't always look like that, but um, <laughs> I'm still in touch with a lot of these girls. And I remember walking through those, those questions and experiences of freshman year with them and feeling very supported and accepted. And they're just a, a glimpse of the overall community. Then my second year of college, I got the opportunity through CCF to travel to Chile to do an exchange student semester. So I studied in a university there, and I also got to intern with a campus ministry that I mentioned before. So this is El Oasis in Santiago. And while I was there, um, I saw what it looks like to do community together, as opposed to, as I've tried many times in my life, to try to head up something alone. Um, part of Chilean culture is being very interdependent, and I saw that right off the bat. That group photo was like my second week in Chile, and we had done like a service week and <clears throat> repairing the house and painting and redoing things. And all of those people showed up to help with the house. Now, about eight of them are team members at the time, but a lot of them are students. Um, you might see Greg and Ellie there and Vicky's there. So people that are now on a team with me. Um, but it was beautiful to see just how many people come together to produce. And my, my whole semester was really filled of experiences of getting to witness how many people it really does take to, to generate a community. You know, you have to have other people around who are willing to integrate the new person. And I got, I got to be a part of that. Um, and it was a very informational, I guess, in a sense, experience. And then the other photo there is me with um, my, who is now my best friend in Chile, Yessi, she's up in the top corner. 
um, next in between her parents and her family. And this was, I think, the first time they invited me over to their house. Um, and it was certainly not the last because I now have a bedroom in their house. <laughs> um, and again, like moving to another country absolutely um, creates many moments of loneliness. And so for somebody who I had just met um, to tell me like, hey, we're going to consider you family. So just come over whenever you want is huge. Um, and it was absolutely God's offering um, into, into my life. And I, I won't go full into Yassi's story right now, but um, she saw it as God giving her a gift as well and is now going to be a, an exchange student intern for a few months in the ministry in Thailand coming up. So I praise God so much because it's been truly a walk of transformation for her as well. So again, community cannot be done alone. And that's not only with other people, but also with the spirit and the power of God coordinating all of those little details. And so then I came back from Chile and um, was again part of CCF, um, but CCF really helped um, generate deeper and really foundational relationships for me. And during those, my last two years of college, basically, I found that a lot of community happened around our <laughs> kitchen table. Um, this, the first photo, the bigger one, is an event we called Gnocchi Night where um, it was sponsored by one of my friends who had been in Uruguay. And there on the 29th of every month, they don't have any money. Um, so they make gnocchi, which you only need flour and potato. And so it's now like become a, more of a, a holiday almost. 29th mm -hmm. of every month, you make gnocchi. And so for a year, I with my friends, we made gnocchi and it was like open house. Anybody can come who wants to come and truly like, saw how much, how how important people felt when they could like form the food that they were going to eat, but they didn't have to bring anything. And it was just a very beautiful glimpse of, of friendship and of community at that time. And um, yeah, and then the pandemic happened and quickly Noki nights were not safe. And so our, our table stayed the same size, but the group gathering around it became smaller. So these were my roommates during the pandemic. Um, the, in the smaller photo, and that was our Easter, our Easter lunch, um, which was another special moment of being like family around a table. And so during during that time, during those table moments, I realized how important friends were in my life in that time, um, that they were being used as messengers of God's truth and love. And my perspective of the importance of tables and sitting down to a meal. Um, has has changed in that sense of just valuing so much what it what it means to truly sit there and make food and enjoy it with people. And the year after that, um, I again experienced Jesus through community, and this time in a little more official sense, in that I was an intern at the Georgia Tech CCF. So I worked as an outreach intern and got to see a little bit of the inner workings of a ministry and a ministry that's rooted in community. And one of the biggest things that I learned is that as a mentor to people in faith, that my questions now, we're back to questions, see that? My questions now and consistency were facilitating trust with them. And that trust allows them to open doors to receive God. Um, so this photo of all of us taking a selfie and mask and having many different emotions on our faces, was on a, during a service project. And I was accompanied by one other intern and two students. And one of them um, <clears throat> showed up to CCF very much by God. Um, literally, yeah, he was lying on the sidewalk, taking a, a nap, which is not normal, but <laughs> he was doing that. And um, one of my, the interns walked past him and was like, hey, you okay? He's like, Meh. And he's like, well, do you want to go eat some free food with me? <laughs> yeah, sure. So he did. And he didn't leave after that. He came to every event um, evermore. And this was, so this was our service event. And we were sorting through very rotten potatoes. Now, who has smelled a rotten potato? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. They don't smell good. And there were um, maybe like 150 pound sacks of these. Well, wow. um, and they stuck through these this whole group and me. Um, we were grateful for the mass at that point. And, 
<laughs> anyway, it also gave us a lot of time for conversations. Um, and the, the conversation helped the, the moment pass a bit faster. And it was neat to see how our relationships grew as a part of just talking um, and just really opened, opened the door for more paths. Yeah, question? Was the gentleman laying on the sidewalk at Georgia Tech student? Yes. <laughs> just wondering. Yes. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, and so part of experiencing community, um, and one thing I would say is a sign of healthy community is that it acts as a trampoline, um, but a, a superpower trampoline, because this one launched me all the way to Chile. Um, but in the sense of there's this health, the healthy, supportive network where you feel safe to, to bounce and explore and to launch into something else. Um, so this is me with some of my closer teams, um, actually on a trip um, with four of my close friends and other interns who also made decisions to go into international ministry during, um, during our intern year. So we all traveled together to do our training in Indianapolis. And um, one thing about me is I love ice cream. I travel for ice cream. So <laughs> we had to stop at this ice cream place because it was supposedly the best ice cream in Indianapolis. And it was good. It wasn't the best of our trip, but it was good. Um, and so I just want to emphasize that the five of us were out of 16, so wait, yeah, um, chose to continue building communities because of our experience at Georgia Tech CCF. And I don't think that comes from just CCF in it of itself, but rather the, the smaller relationships that form as a part of that. And I feel like I continue to see that being a huge influence in people's lives. I see this class right here as well as a very healthy network of relationships and people who want to pray for each other and support each other and go out to dinner and go on retreats. And that's exactly the support we all need to be able to stick on a path towards listening to Jesus and and following him or the support people need to consider Jesus and open a door a little bit more to, to God. Um, so then I went to Chile. Um, I moved there in October of 2021 to Viña del Mar. And this is a photo of us, I think about two weeks after I arrived on our first retreat, which we called a not retreat because we didn't spend the night. The pandemic was was live and well. So we just went for a day to a campground area and had a really good time. Um, and so that was kind of a starting point of my past nine months in Chile. And I would say like the overarching theme for what I learned about communities um, based in Jesus with, with the, our students there is that it gives a lot of hope. Um, I know everyone says, and we've probably all experienced to some extent that the pandemic was a time where it was hard to have hope, whether you were alone or seeing loved ones pass away or get very ill. And for Chileans, most of them spent about, I think it was 14 months in isolation. Um, and for university students, that meant tuning into classes, being evaluated by grades and having very few friends and social connections. And so, we're witnessing how having a life-giving community is also just generating this new sense of the world can be a good place and I'm important and I have people that support me and I would call that hope. Um, so that's a little bit about my journey and how I got to where I am now. Um, I would like to now give you guys a little bit of an idea of what it is that I do. Um, you've now heard the word Eloasis. You've heard me talk about community. And so now I'm going to share what is Eloasis. So this is our mission statement. Um, the mission of Eloasis is one to form a dynamic community. So this is a photo of us from our retreat in um, June, just recently. Clearly we grew, so that was very exciting. Um, but what I love is the different types of people that are in this photo. Um, there are people who are from other countries, from Venezuela or Colombia, who are seeking to restart um, their lives a little bit and have a better economic foundation. There's people who um, are orphans whose parents have passed away. Um, there's people who are Catholics. There are some who are Christians. There's some who are atheists. Um, there are some who really 
hate their family and struggle a lot to continue living under the same roof. There's people who live alone and struggle a lot to have friends. Um, there's people who suffer from social anxiety and continue to decide to show up to large group events and many others. Um, but for us, dynamic community looks like saying, you're welcome here to everyone and trying to facilitate that obviously some two types of people can be very different. And so saying to both, you're welcome here might make one feel like they're not welcome here. And so we work with that. We want to see that tension and to walk through it with them and to help generate some of that welcome welcomingness. <clears throat> Second part of that statement is we want to form a dynamic and sustainable community. So this is our team. Um, Isabel was our exchange student this past semester, so she's also in the photo. Um, but as you see, some of us are American and some of us are Chilean. And fortunately, part of the, the culture of the United States is having nonprofits. It's common for people to offer to donate money because there's a lot of people who work lots of hours, make lots of money, and then have no time to do good or meaningful service work. And so they like to give their money. In Chile, people work to live. And so once they have enough money, they don't really work anymore, which doesn't leave this surplus to then give to other organizations. And they also have an assumption that like nonprofit type work is something that the government's going to do. That makes it really hard for my Chilean teammates to have financial support to be missionaries because they have to invent a culture in their family and loved ones that is basically saying, yeah, I studied at a university that cost money. I spent money on that and I'm not going to get a job to make money with that degree. So I'm going to ask you for money to support me and doing something good. Like, that doesn't make much sense. Um, so part of being a sustainable community is thinking about what is Chilean culture? And is it realistic to think that there's always going to be enough donors from another country, specifically the United States, to keep this community going? Um, and our team has decided that we would like to be sustainable in the sense that Chile can sustain its own ministry. And part of that looks like having a few business affairs within the within the community. <coughs> so Koke and Vicky had that up and have been selling succulents, for instance, and um, selling some other things alongside of their work. Um, and we also contemplate that in the events that we do. We try to stay really low budget, um, not because we don't have the money, but because we we want the students to see that what we do is possible within Chile. Um, and what we do is possible within their lives specifically. And that, that has some challenges in and of itself. Um, but I just wanted to share that that's, that's also a big part of our mission is <clears throat> making sure that our students feel empowered to be able to do missions and ministry um, and that they don't have to be from the United States to do that. <laughs> so the next part of the mission statement is that we search for university students far from faith. That is an active verb. We don't wait in our apartment and hope that people who are far from faith just happen to show up. Um, we go out to campuses. Recently, we've been going out with hot chocolate, um, free hot chocolate to find university students who are far from faith. It also looks like putting promotions on Instagram and doing activities that have nothing to do with Jesus um, in order to provide a space where students who are atheist or part of other religions or have been hurt by the church feel like they can come and be a part of a community that is rooted in Jesus. Oh, wait, sorry, I like that photo. Um, well, let me go back to that. Sorry about that. That's all right. In that photo, um, this is a uh, one more back. Um, so in the photo, we're sitting in our apartment right here, and it was a very impromptu photo, but the girl in the middle um, with the long braids was somebody who showed up at our hot chocolate event and received hot chocolate. And well, actually she almost didn't receive it. She like passed by and we're like, hey, you want hot chocolate? It's free, like really, it's totally free. She was like, mm, and she walked off with her friends and then she came back she was like, yeah, actually I do. And then we're like, great, here it is. And she was like, so what are you, who are you? Which I love that question because then we get to talk about us. Um, and one of the things we shared was we do an English speaking <coughs> event, yes. Concept is OIC uh, an idea, or is it actually a place by the side of the road or a building somewhere? Or? 
Yeah, good question. Um, El Oasis is more so a label for the community because we do have a lot of events outside of our apartment, but we do have an apartment that we refer to as the El Oasis apartment. Um, we hope to have a house someday soon. Most of the campus ministries around the world have these houses. And so, for instance, El Oasis in Santiago refers to the house in addition to the people group. Yeah. Um, so that girl made me very excited because she arrived to an event immediately afterwards um, because she was excited to learn English and that was our event. She stuck around for a while and it, she was the first. She was the first who received a cup of hot chocolate and showed up after about a month of hot chocolate. <laughs> so it was a very <laughs> encouraging thing for me. And after that, we've had more. So good news. Thank you, God. Um, but always the first is a, is a big deal. We're celebrating. And the final part of our mission, mission statement is we're searching these uni university students far from faith so that they can experience Jesus. Um, so this is a photo of me with one of my dear friends, Chris. Um, she, she showed up and we as a team afterwards were like, eh, she's probably not coming back. Didn't seem like she really liked this, but she did. She came back and then she came on our retreat and a lot of um, a lot of her time in the community made her a big fan of the community. And she's like, there's just something different here. I just love it so much. Um, and, but then she would kind of like fade away. But one day um, for Easter, actually, I invited her over for lunch on Easter day. And afterwards she was like, yeah, I'm having a really bad allergic reaction to a flea bite and I need to go to the emergency room. I was like, you think are you like you came to lunch first and then the emergency room <laughs> and she's like yeah my parents like my mom was pretty upset about that but she's like I've realized that there is something even more important than my physical health and I I need to take care of myself by being a part of your your group about of this community and that was the first time she'd really said anything to refer to like the importance of a spiritual and social health um so those are the things we look for to have hope and see that the spirit is starting to work and like the little seed is, is sprouting. And I hope the next time I'm back, I'll have a, another great story to tell about her. So speaking of God's faithfulness, um, I have several stories to share. However, I realize that we're coming close on time and want to have space for questions. So I'm going to skip ahead to questions. If we have time, I'll share those stories. And if not, I've got newsletters. I have a phone number. You can call me. We can we can talk about those stories. Sound good? Will you skip ahead a few slides? There's one. Wonderful. Yeah. Questions? I have some prompts up there if you need them. Yes. Uh, I can't remember what you said her name was. The girl with the play. Uh, but is she from Chile or is she from? She is from Chile, yes. Um, there's a lot of German influence and heritage in Chile. And so she has blonde hair, blue eyes because of her German ancestry. Yeah. Did you, have you had to become completely fluent in Spanish for this uh, mission? Um, have I had to? No, but it would be really hard without it. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of, a lot of people who start on the mission field and do not speak Spanish. Um, it makes their process a lot different. Um, they end up connecting mostly with students who speak English for their first time. They take Spanish classes, meet people who are learning Spanish. And so their walk looks very different, but God is using them to meet people and have conversations equally. I knew Spanish before, so my walk looks a little bit different in that I'm meeting with students who speak Spanish as opposed to English and um, getting able to just kind of work my way in a little, I would say a little bit easier. But, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about your parent organization, uh, where it got started, um, you know, what's the background? Yeah, um, the Christian Missionary Fellowship um, International started in the 1940s. Um, it was a group of college students, supposedly, um, who, who started that, who kind of realized that there, it's great when individual missionaries go to other countries, but there's a lack of accountability with that. And so they decided to form a fellowship of missionaries to be able to have accountability in the missions they're doing. And since the 1940s, the, the fellowship has really grown. It's adopted some smaller organizations. It started its own. One of the most recent started in a few years ago, and it's called Marketplace Ministries. So it's a ministry style that sets up um, 
basically like small businesses in other countries that need some more economic development. And so the, the ministers work as like job and business coaches and but also provide time for Bible studies and small groups to form Christian community within businesses. So I think that's interesting. So I highlight that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Is that non-denominational then? I yes. Mean, so you have people from all different. Yeah. All different denominations. Yep. There's many, many churches who support the different missionaries. So I imagine all the denominations covered is, is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm curious about the questions that you ask people other than, well, where are you from? And, uh, you know, some of the no, no questions. So how do you, and where did you learn that? Is that something that you learn through uh, a training that you go through prior to? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, and I would say, so some of the questions one one thing I say when somebody's like, how do you how do you know what to ask somebody? I'm like, it's got to come from your own personal curiosity, but it also has to come thinking first of the person you're asking the question to. I don't know where I learned that. I think it was in CCF um, because I was really caught off guard at the beginning by how intentional their questions were, and then that people remembered my answers, and so that's really inspired me to ask questions that that helped me form a relationship with the person I'm talking to. So for instance, I know I love food and I also like one-on-one -on -one time with people. And so if I'm meeting a new student at an event for the first time, one of my favorite questions is, what do you like to eat? And where do you go to eat that? Or how do you cook it? Because I know from there I can say, well, could we sometime maybe get together and eat that thing? Or could I go out and we could go to that restaurant together? But there's other times when I know somebody and it's like, they just told me, a, like, yeah, I just don't like being at home with my mom. It's like, well, if there's some trust in that relationship, I might ask, like, what is it that's hard about your mom? If there's not trust in that relationship yet, I probably won't ask that question. So it's also feeling the relationship out. Does that help? Yeah, very good. Yeah. This is a follow-up to that. So it sounds like it's really, it's about the establishment of the community and, and the connection one-to-one -on -one with someone rather than you preaching to someone or you sharing your beliefs, which the person may or may not be even open to hearing that right, right then. Is that right? Yeah, um, that's, that's kind of the perspective we take, which is amazing because they ask the questions then. It's like, um, what's, what's the deal with all the free food? Like, I'm a stranger. Why, why is this? And honestly, that in of itself is an opportunity to say, well, there's people around the world who recognize us as a Christian ministry and find what we do to be important. And they also believe in God's grace, which is something you receive before you earn it. And so we like to offer food and a community before you do anything to earn it. And like, just like that, I've had an opportunity to share something so key about who God is in a way that they relate, understand, and can choose to accept, or like, that was a little weird, but I'm going to eat the free food, you know? <laughs> and I'll be back for free food. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, I just want to say another thing to our class. We have something that was mentioned about something called dinner church. And this is something that's very similar to what you all are doing. And there'll, there'll be people in our church that are trying to get something like that started within the church, but outside of the church. And not necessarily bringing people into the church, but reaching out by us going to the community, being the mentors, going out into the community to bring this acceptance to people yeah. that you're doing. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, one of the things we're trying to do with our students who are kind of graduating college and phasing out of the community is to equip them with what they need to facilitate communities and Christ-centered conversations outside of a like church setting or like a mission group setting. I think it's probably one of the most Jesus-like forms of ministry and also something that's incredibly rewarding and, and natural. So that's, I actually think I <clears throat> saw a glimpse of an email or a post or something and seeing those dinner table groups and just, it, it filled me with such gratitude for what this church is and how they're constantly 
seeking to facilitate and multiply it within the church. So, um, I believe it's past 1045, so I'll stick around for three minutes, but I have to go to Chapel Roswell. Feel free to follow me over there if you want to hear a talk. Um, I also have some pamphlets um, with my contact information and a few more details, so if you would like that, feel free to come up and get that from me. Thank you again for having me this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I think we all understand why your friend yes his family rapidly put a bedroom aside for you to have you around. You, that was an astonishing presentation, particularly from a young woman of your age. And thank you for the work you're doing for Jesus and for, for 